Hey guys, welcome back to Schizo in episode 17. Topic today is root finding, aka solving equations. You know, pea brains like me, we can subtract two from both sides, solve an equation, but how does a computer do that? That's today's video. It should be a short one, so stick around. The first question should be, what is a root? Well, root is an elitist gatekeeping word for where a function is zero. Where does this orange line cross the X axis. And ultimately the question is not so much does it cross, but at what value of X does it cross? At seven, at 12, you know, what value of X gives us the orange line equal in zero? The next question that you should ask would be who cares where something is zero? And really the answer is nobody cares. Um, but the thing is you can actually trick society and the universe and yourself into things actually being useful by representing useful things as this orange curve. If this is a curve for which crossing zero is useful, then finding that zero would also be useful. I'll give you an example. So let's say you're, you know, Hamas and you want to shoot a rocket and there's a, you have a trajectory plan for that rocket. And you also know that there's an Israeli flight, you know, path in some certain direction, a passenger flight, well, you know, you could subtract those two curves and you can find, you know, the impact point where that difference is zero. So yeah, that would work. Of course, you have to worry about time. Of course, there's three variables for the spatial dimensions, but you know, the principle is the same. Where these curves intersect, that difference between them is zero. So yeah, there are uses for this. So how would you find the root? Now, if you asked me how to find the root, what I would probably do is I'd say, well, I'm just gonna start at some number guessing. I'm just gonna start guessing numbers and I'm gonna keep increasing my guess. So I'll set, say I'm guessing like negative five, I'll guess negative four, negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. Once, I, once my guess changes sign, like once the F value changes sign, I'll say, okay, hold on, there's a root there. Because there's no way a function got from being below zero to being above zero without crossing zero. And then I would say, well, how am I gonna find where this zero is? Well, I take those points and I would bisect between them until I, I found something. And that's called the bisection method. It's very simple to implement. Um, and I'm, it's so simple, I'm not gonna even give you any, any like algorithmic expressions here. It's just so simple, you can do it you know, yourself. The way it works is you first guess some bounds. So you pick bounds in, in between which the function crosses zero. If it doesn't cross, you made a mistake. Um, next step, so here you can see the this red line crosses the x-axis at this point here. And so I've, you know, I've picked two bounds on the outsides of that. So the root is contained within them. Then we bisect the bounds. So I cut halfway between those two blue lines and I make a new pink line. And then what I do is I say, well, if I evaluate this red curve at the lower bound, I'm negative. If I evaluate it at the upper bound, I'm positive. And if I evaluate it at my bisection, again, I'm negative. And so what I do is I replace the old negative with the new negative, and I keep repeating that process until you can see here, until I get bored, which works. And this will slowly converge, you know, 50% reduction in your guess, in your in your bounds, every iteration until you get to your, to be close enough to your root that you'd stop. Next question would be, well, are there other ways? And the answer is, of course, there's other ways. There's plenty of other ways, but honestly, they're all worse in my opinion. Um, so Newton's method is a, is a very common thing that you'll hear. It's also relevant to other fields like optimization. Um, but the process is simple. Basically what you do is you make an initial guess somewhere random. Ideally, it would be close to the, to the root. And then what you do is you use a linear approximation essentially to improve your guess. So basically you evaluate the function value and the slope at your, your guess. And assuming it was a line, you compute, well, if, if I have this point on a line and this line slope, well, where would it cross zero? And it would cross zero at, if it was a line, you that guess. Uh, and so basically you can see here, if we follow this, the slope P 
pink line from the orange point down to the x-axis, that would be where we would anticipate our root to be. Unfortunately, this is not a red line, it's a red curve, and so it's not gonna exactly hit zero there. But that's our next guess. So we would, again, reevaluate our slope and function value at this orange guess, and we would, again, improve our next guess in a linear way. So yeah, pretty straightforward process. Here's the expression. The problem is, is that it requires, for, so your future guess requires your current guess, the function evaluate your current guess, but also the slope. And the issue is, is that you don't have slopes in real life. In general, you're not gonna even have analytical functions in real life. And so this is gonna be a matter of you running some code and, and pulling out values. Analytical expressions don't exist, at least they aren't very useful in real life. And so for that, we have the secant method. And what it does is basically it constructs an estimate of the slope based off previous guesses. So here's the expression. You can take a look and see how that works. It's pretty straightforward. You're just basically estimating the slope with previous guesses and using that to formulate your next guess. The last question that you should ask is, well, when do we stop this iteration process? And of course, I kept saying, oh, stop when you get bored. That's fine. You know, if you have dinner at six o'clock or you have to go sleep at nine o'clock, stop. That's fine. No one's going to rush you. Um, but there are other ways to stop as well. One would be some number of iterations that say, well, I'm, I only have time for 100 iterations, no more. And I'm not going to have a good answer. And it's like, they do at least 100. So 100, 100 iterations is what I'm going to do. That's fine. You can do that. You can also say, well, when my function gets close to zero, I'll stop. When this, when this red line gets close to zero, when the distance from the x-axis to my guess is below some tolerance, I'll stop. That works as well. That's a good way to do it. And a final way to do it would be, well, when my guess stops changing very much, then I'll stop. When my, when my first, when my 27th guess is 6.5 and my next guess is 6.500001, I'm close enough. So that's how you could also stop. And there are many more ways to condition a stop, but these are, I guess, some simple ones. So now let's check out the code. Three examples, one for each method that I just discussed, all aptly named. They're all example 17 in the SoyHub suppository. Let's take a look. So again, it's all in the, it's in the code. Take a look. Let's take a look at the functions themselves. I have it here, I believe. So they all have the same overall format and I'm not gonna go into the math necessarily that they're implementing. It's all straightforward and you can take a look at the code yourself, but I'll show you how the, the functions in the IO goes, how are we pulling in inputs to our function and giving out outputs. Here's how the bisection method works. So. The bisection method takes, this function takes uh, looks like four inputs. The first one is in RDI. That's a function pointer that points to the function of interest. So that, that's the f of x. So that function pointer will be the address in memory of a function of this form down here. And so it would be basically a function that takes a floating point number and returns a floating point number in x and m0. So you'd have to make that separately. That's your job. If you want to optimize something, you want to solve a route somewhere, you have to write the function yourself. It's not pre-made for you. That's your job to make the function. And this function should only affect registers x of m0. No other sh should be affected. Besides that, there are three other inputs, and they're all floating points. So the first two are going to be the bounds, the lower and upper bound. And the last one would be your tolerance. So here we're using a tolerance to stop our iteration process. Um, but besides that, that's all the inputs. It does return two outputs. In Rx, it will return the number of iterations that were required to converge. And the last input would, last output would be the actual root itself in X of M0. And here you can take a look yourself and see how it's how it works. It checks for valid bounds. It checks against tolerance. It replaces the bounds with the algorithm I described previously. And at the end of the day, it uh, preserves registers and returns your root as expected. Um, the Newman's method function is very similar. The only difference would be that now 
same outputs, but you are now passing in two function pointers. One would be the function itself, and the second would be the slope function, the derivative function, f prime, whatever you want to call it, that's also passed in. And it only takes in two floating point inputs. It takes your first guess and your tolerance. And it can, you can take a look and see how it works. Basically, it uh, it just loops in the same way, checks your tolerance, and uh, returns your solution. It's a very primitive algorithm, so it's very simple to implement. Last would be the secant method. Very much the same thing, but remember, secant method, you don't have to pass in a slope function, so you're only passing in the function pointer to the f function itself, as well as, in this case, you have to pass in two guesses. Two guesses to construct the slope, right? So you pass in two guesses, in x of m0 and x of m1, as well as a tolerance in x of m2. Put a parenthesis there. And that's that's it. That's that's the functions that we're talking about in today's video. So let's now look at the actual code that we're running in these examples. So first example would be the bisection method. And in all these examples, I am solving square roots. So let's take a look at the code here. In this case, you can see we're including a few things. We're including some functions to print, as well as the bisection method function that I just described. And here, you can see we're trying to solve the square root of two. And so the way this works is, if you want to solve for the square root of two, what, what number satisfies square root of two? Well, whatever that number that is, if you square it and subtract two, you'll get zero, right? So that's what we're doing. We're, this function takes a value, squares it, subtracts two, and returns. So when this function, square root of two, hits zero, that meant that the input was the square root of two. And so here you can see we're passing in the function pointer in RDI, passing in lower and upper bounds, and a tolerance, and calling that function, and then printing the result. What are our bounds? Our bounds are one and three. Obviously, square root of two falls between those bounds, and our tolerance here is 0 0.00001. So if I leave this and I run, you can see that function worked. We estimate the square root of two to be 1.414. If I open up Octave and I evaluate the square root of two, you'll see that it comes out to be the same number to within that tolerance. Okay, very cool. Um, next example, example B, this is the secant method. Let's take a look in the code here. In this case, we're including a different function. We're including the secant method function, but the rest of the code is the same, except now we're trying to solve the square root of three. So what this function here does is it multiplies the number by itself, subtracts three, and the idea is when you pass in the square root of three, this function will return zero. And so again, you can see we're passing in function pointer to square root of three, passing in our guesses. This should say guesses, so I'll say guess one, guess two and tolerance and I'll change those down here really quick because I've changed the name so guess two is that how it was I guess one and obviously square root of three falls between one and four. Oh crap a lot of copy and paste going on here guys sorry I'm not in a rush I swear if I run this you'll see oh crap oh it's underscore hold on scuffed video I knew I did it underscore. Square root of three, 1.73, it looks familiar to me. How about you? Okay, last example, example C. This was Newton's method. Now this one is interesting because it requires us to have an implementation for the slope. So in this case, we're past, we have a square root of five function. As before, you pass in a value that hopefully is the square root of five. When we, dump, when we square it and subtract five, we'll get zero. But now I have a function called slope square root of five, which is the derivative of x squared minus five, which is just two x. So all this function does is it multiplies the input by two and returns. With this, basically now we're able to pass in the actual function pointer itself for the function, as well as for the derivative of that function, a guess and a tolerance and call the Newton's method 
assembly function. And uh, yeah, our first guess you can see here is three and tolerance is 0 0.00001. If we run this, we get 2.236. If I open up Octave and calculate the square roots of five, that's the answer that we get, professionally speaking. So yes, our root finding methods do seem to work. We're able to compute these extremely important things like square root of two, three, and five. Great, great work. With that out of the way, uh, I want to thank you for watching. That's the entirety of today's video. It wasn't that long at all. Um, if you're interested in hanging out, we have a Discord server. Check out the description. See you around.